today excited to be looking again at the benefits of Christian living. How many of you are glad that you know the Word of God? There, there's so many people who I work with who I'm around on a daily basis, and you can just tell from the way they handle issues in life, they don't have that peace, they don't have that love, they don't have that assurance that God is looking out for their best interest. I may go through difficult times, and I do go through difficult times, but I always have that hope. God has something good that is going to end up happening. Something good is going to end up being on the way. As we study today God's goodness, you know, life isn't always fair, but God is always good. And we have a choice in life, and throughout this lesson, I hope you think of that. On the one side, I can choose to do good. The scripture says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Or I can choose to do bad, and then I obviously have that judgment and the consequences of my own actions. But our focus verse today is Psalms 107 and 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. And I was hoping as we start out, if you wouldn't mind standing with me, let's go to the Lord in prayer, but let's also thank him for his mercies which are new every day. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness to us. We say that continually, but it is so true in your word teaches, and that's specifically what we're studying today. If there's anyone here today who is estranged from you, who are struggles in their mind, maintaining that thought that you have their best interest at heart, I ask you to speak through your words today. Encourage everyone here today. Let the seeds of goodness be planted into them. Let your anointed word come forth with power. We give you praise and we give you glory for your goodness and for your mercies. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Lord bless you. You may be seated. And moving right on through that Psalms 107, that entire chapter is kind of our text for today. And you'll notice as you read the book of Psalms, I really wish, I don't wish that we had more time, honestly. I, I spend a ton of time with the last who does, everybody who teaches, spend a lot of time preparing. I'm not asking for more time, Pastor, if you hear this. But it's hard to condense everything into it. And the book of Psalms has so many poetic pieces you'll never know just reading it in English or without thinking of. I took a, a Bible class, I remember years ago, at Illinois Central College at ICC. And I was shocked to find all of the literary devices in there. Some of the books, some of the chapters, every verse is like the alphabet A through Z. And he just starts off writing it, but it's in Hebrew, so you don't notice it. In English, it isn't A, B, C, D, E, F, G. But if you was to convert it to Hebrew, it's just like that, alphabetically laid out. And this Psalms 107 is laid out, and there's some neat literary devices in it. But as you read Scripture, if you see something repeated, you know, I'm the one who's always talking about how concise Scripture is. There's all this content that the Lord inspired people to condense into just one line of verse. And you really got to think about it, pray about it to get out that meat. Well, here in this one chapter, he repeats this statement four different times. And whenever space is valuable and the scripture repeats it, it's for emphasis. So I recognize, oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. So it's not just that God is good generically, it's specifically he's doing works on the behalf of his children, on behalf of you. You're coming to him with needs and he's answering them. Oh, give God thanks because for those wonderful works that he's doing. Not that we're to be materialistic, it's not what we're talking about here, but God knows, the scripture in other places states it, he knows that you have needs and he's going to end up providing for them and some beautiful scriptures on that. Our focus thought today is that God is good by nature. And it's shown by his relationship with mankind. And I'm sure every one of you, whenever you take that time to stop and to reflect, it's overwhelming to think that a God, my children and, and Jennifer, starting to have much more meaningful conversations as the boys have gotten older. Where did God come from? This beginning. What is that power that can create a world? And are there other worlds? I mean, just fun conversations to have. But a God who can do that would choose to have relationship with us. It blows your mind whenever you stop and think about it. And then you're in a service like the prayer meeting last night. Or you're at a need and the anointing of the Holy Ghost comes upon you. That is overwhelming to recognize. The God of all eternity <laughs> has your best interest in heart. He's looking out for you. Oh, that's encouraging to me, brothers and sisters. Whenever we look at our culture, it can be disappointing to hear that a cultural icon has failed morally. There was the tele-evangelist, seemed to be a rash of them years ago. And news reporting is, of course, quick to publicize the details of every politician who has an extramarital affair, every athlete who uses performance-enhancing drugs, every business person who commits fraud or embezzlement. And every time one of these stories appears in the news, good people are saddened. Because when high-profile figures are immoral, the whole culture is really affected in a negative way. 
You start to look at other people suspiciously. It's disappointing about them, but then you start to wonder, I wonder if this other person who's in a similar role is doing the same thing. In such cases, we're disillusioned. We find it difficult not to question our faith in others. And we can be tempted to think that everybody is hypocritical and disingenuous. And then if I have some shortcoming, it's easy to say, well, you know, it's not as bad as somebody else. So our, our world in its moral decay has contributed to the world being less good. And so whenever you are good, it stands out separately. So let me mention the value of a good testimony. Because you're ambassadors of Christ. And if somebody is only going to meet you in their lifetime, and that may possibly happen as an ambassador of Christ, who are they meeting? Am I on my Jesus ambassador role today? Or have I let carnality come over and I have no time for them today? It takes years to build trust, faith, respect, and a good reputation. Can anybody imagine how long it takes to destroy a reputation? One carnal decision that is found out about Protect your testimony, brothers and sisters. Let me ask you this. Is Facebook killing your testimony? I cringe at some of the people who I work with who claim to be Christians. Some of them, and I, I shouldn't say claim, they're, they believe in the Lord. They're wanting to, to serve God to the best of their knowledge. But some of their posts, I'm like, what in the world? There is nothing Christ-like about what you're posting. And I'm embarrassed to say some brothers and sisters who I've known closely cringe whenever I see posts. You're an ambassador of Christ. They know you. They know you're representing Jesus. Protect your testimony. Of course, the reality is that one failure or even many failures does not take away from the many people who are upright and trustworthy. And I there's many of you who I look to as heroes of the faith, of pillars of the church, society, good people who I'm so thankful to be a part of the body of Christ. But it does seem that humanity loses a little bit each time that a scandal is made public. And in the midst of such uncertainty, how comforting it is to know that our God is unfailingly good. He is above reproach. And I may fail, and you may have to say and make excuses for me, but my God is never going to fail you. And you can point, you know what? Brother Grant failed, but he serves a God who has never failed. You can continue pointing to him. He is always and uncompromisingly good. He will never let us down. People of all faith of all generations have discovered this. And one way that God demonstrates his goodness is that he responds to prayer. He demonstrates his mercy by meeting specific needs of those who pray. But the Charlesville was the most recent big example I can think of. Going to the doctor, what, two months ago? And the doctor's telling him he has the most aggressive form of lip cancer that there is calling in his family for the return visit to plan out treatment. And that same doctor having to come out and say, I don't know what's changed, but I know that was cancer. It no longer is cancer. You are going to be fine. Oh, that, that's exciting to end up hearing that. And every one of you have testimonies or know of people, firsthand experiences that God has done. I have a wonderful testimony of how I went to apply for a one job, and I ended up getting a totally different job. I applied for the wrong job, and God worked it to my favor. It's a long story. You'd have to hear the back. I don't have time to tell about it. I've told it before. Every one of you could tell a story. Look what God has ended up doing. God is good. There's all kinds of aspects of God's goodness. I'm not going to be able to cover them, obviously. But one aspect I do want to talk about is God's goodness leads men and women to repentance. The scripture in Romans 2 and 4 says, Or despiseth thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Because if I didn't have an opportunity to repent, I would have been lost a long time ago, irreparably. But God has given us this opportunity to repent. And the context around Romans 2 and 4 involves the universal sinfulness of humans. And some, though, may misunderstand God's long-suffering to mean he will never hold them accountable for their sins. But the reason God doesn't immediately judge sin is he gives sinners a time to repent. And though sinners deserve judgment, God in his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering attempts to lead them to repentance. Then there's those who take advantage of this judgment to sin to further despise the goodness of God. And that's exactly how he sees that. The scripture's plain on it. He's attempting to help them avoid judgment, but they're refusing his help. And then Psalms 107 demonstrates God's willingness to respond to those who cry out to him in their trouble. 
Again, this verse is duplicated. Again, it's in the same chapter. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses, verse 6. And he repeats it, the psalmist does, right in verse 13. Just again, that emphasis. They were in trouble. They cried out to God. God ended up being the remedy for them. It's important to remember, though, these Israelites were in trouble and distresses, not because God was mean. This was because of blatant rebellion against the Lord. It's never God's intention for them to wander in the wilderness. Their wandering was due to their rebellion against him. When you're following close to the Lord, I remember bishops talking about this one time, at least I've always attributed it to him, that you stay under an umbrella of his protection. It's like wherever I go, Satan may rain down all kinds of things against me, but as long as I stay close to the shepherd, his, his arms are going to be that shadow, that umbrella of protection and promise around me. And whenever I begin to sin, I purposefully begin to walk away from God. Well, then I, of course, walk out from under his protection and his promises. And we have access to God's goodness any time. By turning away from our sin and by crying out to him for help. Because a sincere cry of repentance and recognition of our need of the Lord, it's a start to renewing and revival in our own life. But it certainly isn't the end. Because as you've learned, just saying you're sorry isn't all there is to repentance. Because I can come and slap you upside the face and say I'm sorry. And five minutes later, Brother Matthewson, I can do it again. And you're not going to think that I was truly sorry, are you? <laughs> There's more to it than just saying I'm sorry. The Bible tells us about some self-righteous people who came out to see John the Baptist's ministry to sinners. Then went out to him of Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers! Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. He didn't say just apologize and be baptized. Yeah, join. You see everybody else being baptized? You join right in here. It's fine. You bring some meats. I want you to prove to me that you're repentant. So what is this fruit of repentance? The first one is godly sorrow. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9 through 10, it says, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorrow." but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorrow after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. In other words, God's saying, there was a purpose to this sorrow. You're going to have all kinds of sorrow in the world from your own sin. There's nothing good about that. That's just a reaction to my own failings. But whenever God brings sorrow upon you, or conviction may be another word, there is a purpose for it. If it can get you to repent, it is beneficial for you to have gone through that godly sorrow. You need to express that. I am truly sorry. I'm not just, just, not just lip service. My spirit, my attitude shows I am, have a godly sorrow for what I did. Second thing is there will be a change of life as a fruit of that repentance. Acts 3 and 19 says, Repent ye therefore and be converted. What does it mean to be converted? It means something is changed. There is a definite, I was this way and now I am different. That your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And then the third fruit of repentance I want to talk about is restitution. Leviticus chapter 6 lays out the law of restitution. But in the New Testament, there's such a beautiful example of the goodness of God working in Zacchaeus. And this is recorded in Luke 19. Jesus came to visit Zacchaeus' home, and the people all knew that chief publican as a wicked and oppressive man. I'm sure many of those in the crowd had been cheated by him. And they're asking, what in the world is Jesus doing hanging around this wicked man? And Luke 19, 8 through 10 says, And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. God's answering those people who is questioning. I didn't come here just to hobnob around with godly people. i am come to reach to people who are willing to make a change, willing to say, I see there is a better way. I am willing to repent and to end up changing. From Zacchaeus' words, we gather, number one, he had been guilty of defrauding people. Number two, he was remorseful over his past actions. And number three, he was committed to making restitution. That, brothers and sisters, is repentance. 
Zacchaeus' sin was forgiven, the scripture tells us. And the fruit of his repentance was both his public confession and then his restitution, following through, giving people back what he had defrauded them of. His sincerity was evident in the fact that it was his immediate desire to repay those he had cheated. He was changed. He was converted. Here was a man who was penitent. He was contrite, and the proof of his conversion to Christ was his resolve to atone as much as possible for his past sins. He's not earning salvation. He's not paying the way. He's just getting that guilt off of his conscience. I know that I stole this from Miranda. I'm going to give that back to her. I can't in good conscience continue on. That is truly a picture of restitution of repentance. The Bible tells us that the Lord's mercy endures forever. And this is another aspect of God's goodness. One of the most remarkable biblical examples of this is found in the book of Lamentations. And this book expresses Jeremiah's horror over the destruction of Israel when the city was invaded by Babylon in 586 B.C. And one thing that makes it such a significant account of mercy is the acknowledgement of Scripture that this destruction was the judgment of God for Judah's rebellion. Lamentations 1 and 5 says, The Lord hath afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions, her children are gone unto God into captivity before the enemy. And the Bible gives us even more insight into the context of the destruction in Lamentations 3, 31 through 36. It says, For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he doth not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men, to crush under his feet all the prisoners of the earth, to turn aside the right of a man before the face of the Most High, to subvert a man in his cause, the Lord approveth not. As a father, I can so relate to this. Just my children, whenever I have to correct them, it isn't this big joy that I get with the clousing. Oh, I get to really tear into Nolan today and tell him what's for. It, it's, it's with frustration, but it's a sense of this is a good young man who is going to continue to be good with everything I can instruct him. He is going to turn out good. <laughs> I'm willing to sacrifice a little peace here and implement some discipline in order to make that happen. A literal translation of that Hebrew phrase rendered, he doth not afflict willingly, is he does not afflict from his heart. Although it may be necessary for God to discipline us, that affliction isn't what's at the heart of God. We just studied a few weeks ago, God is love. That's what that comes out of the heart of God in all cases. He may be having to give discipline, but it's discipline in love. The heartbeat of God is love. And hope rises from the ashes of this story when Jeremiah recalls to mind the enduring nature of God's mercy. Lamentations 3, 22 through 26 says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, from which that great hymn comes. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul, therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. The Lord, one of the aspects of his goodness, his mercies endure. The Lord is also not willing that any should perish. The Lord's reluctance to see anyone perish is not just seen in the Old Testament in relation to temporal suffering, but also in the New Testament in relation to eternal salvation. In 2 Peter 3 and 9 tells us, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. Do you know people who need to come to repentance? And sometimes I struggle of, I don't know that that person is ready for it. I don't know that that person is wanting it. God suffered. He sacrificed. He paid the price so that all would come to repentance. And once you lay out for them what a goodness, what a benefit of God's goodness it is, who wouldn't want that? And yet so many times I'm intimidated by my, and between my own ears. In this context, this verse indicates the reason the Lord has not yet returned is because he's long-suffering. He continues to delay judgment, which our human rebellion deserves, in order to give people that opportunity to repent. In his words to the church in Thyatira, Jesus said in reference to Jezebel even, and I gave her space to repent of her fornication, but she repented not. That's Revelation 2.21. And Ezekiel 33.11 says, Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, 
but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Can you not just see the Lord here saying, it's very plain. You have a choice to do good and to reap all the benefits of my love that I created you to have. If you choose, certainly you can be in eternal separation from you. You can be in death, spiritual death, physical death. Why would you end up doing that? Why would you end up making that choice? Peter's earlier statement that God is not willing that any should perish, that all that should come to repentance indicates anybody can be saved. There's nobody who's outside of God's love. Pastor Reach recently has been teaching on that apostolic burden. I mentioned to him last Thursday with every or last Wednesday with everything going on, how passionately he was teaching that apostolic burden. He said that's the only way to teach that sort of a message. And man, I appreciate him helping us to recognize that we have to have a sensitive spirit to accomplish God's work. Yesterday, Nolan and I was together. Jennifer went to Wisconsin to a, a wedding shower for our niece. He and I went out by Best Buy, and there was a big neighborhood garage sale. And because pastor's been teaching on that, my heart had been resensitized, and I'm walking through this neighborhood. He was praying for people as I saw them coming. Because every interaction we get, I'm either going to make a positive or a negative influence, right? If I just frown at them, they don't have to know me. They're still going to have a negative thought. Well, I'm trying to greet everybody and just see, God, are you going to open up a door? Is there an opportunity for me to end up being a witness right here in this neighborhood? You know, I have to tell you, Sister Flowers, I saw you driving by with Nolan, and you didn't even wave at us. So I don't know that that feeling is reciprocal. <laughs> Nolan said, my goodness, she, we're both waving, and her and Brother Flowers both. Neither one of them saw. I said, she is a professional garage shopper. I can tell you what she's doing. She's looking to see, is this worth stopping? She's not looking at the people. She's looking at the merchandise. So I knew what was going on. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. Today is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6 and 2, Paul quoted the Lord speaking in the book of Isaiah. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Pastor has been talking about us to us for months about our involvement in God's ministry of reconciliation. And 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 21 tells us God has given us that ministry of reconciliation. We've been allowed to be a part of his life-saving, soul-healing ministry to our world. We're ambassadors of Christ. We represent him. And when strangers meet us, what is their impression? Not of me, but once they learn I'm a Christian, what is their impression of a Christian? Is it positive? Is it negative? Some of that rides on my representation to them. God in all of his goodness does finally come to a place of judgment where there is a limit. And the fact that God is good and merciful doesn't mean that you'll never face judgment. And even if that judgment of God is never brought to bear in our lifetime, Hebrews 9.27 states, It is appointed unto men once to die, and after that is the judgment. And a reference to the certainty of this judgment appears at the end of the Bible. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 12 says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. I was just reading through one of the publishing house um, articles that end up coming out and Brother Bernard was talking through that and he talked of saving faith and it's one thing to believe something but it's something else to obey it and he talked about all the instances of having faith Noah believed God but if he had said Lord I'm not going to build the ark I'm not going to do the work he would not have been saved he had to believe that God was going to bring rain but he had to follow through and obey that and multiple iterations of stories through scripture I'd never paid attention to that God has that answer he gives you the answer and as long as you have faith in it it's great but then you got to follow in and do that works meet for repentance Romans 6 23 says for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord as we've studied the scriptures today it's clear that God is not looking for reasons to judge and destroy he's looking for reasons to forgive and to heal in the account of Sodom and Gomorrah provides an example of this when the Lord told Abraham his plan to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham negotiated with him in an effort to avoid the destruction of Lot's family. And down the number came from 50 righteous to finally just 10 righteous. Lord, if 10 righteous are in that city, will you, will you save them? Assuming his family would have at least had that many people. And one can only wonder what God's response would have been if Abraham had continued his negotiations, right? 
One thing we can learn from this story is that God was not wishing to destroy. He looks for reasons to forgive and to save. And as Jeremiah said after viewing the wretched scene of death and destruction at Jerusalem, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. His mercies are new every morning. In other words, justice called for the complete obliteration of Jerusalem and its population. And those who were spared were evidence of God's merciful compassion. So was the situation in Sodom. The survival of Lot and his two daughters demonstrate God's love. It demonstrates his mercy and his goodness, his reaching, continuing reaching out to us. The scripture we've studied in this lesson suggests three specific courses of action as they relate to God's goodness. First, we should pray specific prayers. Israel's experience with the goodness of God as described in Psalms 107 was a consequence of the prayer recorded in Psalms 106 and 47. And that prayer in Psalms 106, 47 was a prayer for deliverance. But it wasn't just generic. It was a prayer to be gathered from among the Gentiles. They wanted to be back in their own land. It was a prayer of restoration to the promised land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In just a few verses later, we hear the response to that prayer in 107 and 3. Psalms tells us they were gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. God heard the specific request and he answered exactly the way they was asking. An examination of prayers recorded in scriptures reveals that many of them are specific prayers. Because to pray is to talk with God. And it's so significant that while it's worthwhile to spend time in thoughtful prayer, I don't know how many of you guys make a list, but whenever somebody asks for prayer up here, Bishop was asking last night, I sometimes can't keep up with all of them. So I have my own little, just a prayer list I keep in one note on my phone. And sometimes I'll just run through that list. I'll pray. I doesn't do that every day, but sometimes I'll just pull it out. And it reminds me, these are people who I've forgotten to pray. But it's significant because I believe God's hearing. And I don't want to let too long go before I'm calling before God. Lord, here's this lost loved one of one of you guys. Ben and Caleb, to this day, are still somebody who's in my list. God, that is a godly family. They were raised right. I ask you to end up bringing salvation to that household. Specific prayers. An examination of all of those shows, that's exactly what the church did. Although Paul did say he would pray with the Spirit, a reference to praying in tongues, he also said he would pray with understanding. Our second course of action is to embrace the goodness of God, to accept his mercy and forgiveness. Some wrestle with an ongoing sense of guilt and condemnation, perhaps from a notion that to confess being forgiven is to put them into a dangerous assumption or situation. But such thinking discounts the work of Christ on the cross and questions its efficacy. From the perspective of the Old Testament, a failure to acknowledge that one's prayer is answered and the work is done runs counter to those words found four times in Psalms 107. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. I've mentioned recently, I love to hear testimonies. And I had many people come up and talking after that, telling of testimonies and of their excitement of hearing testimonies. As apostolic burden grows, we're starting to see apostolic results, and I'm looking forward to apostolic testimonies. Look what God has done. And the third course of action is to forgive others. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he included these words. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. This prayer is meant to be prayed daily because it includes that phrase, give us this day our daily bread. When we forgive others, it demonstrates the genuineness of our confession and opens the door for us ourselves to receive forgiveness. In closing, God is love. God is good, and God believes in you. He believes in me. I don't deserve to be believed in. In my humanness, I am nothing. But all with the power of the Holy Ghost he's placed inside of us. God believes you can do exploits. This is what the scripture ends up telling us. God believes. Let's see which scripture am I on right here. John 1 and 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. He believes in you, even to them that believe on his name. He's given us power to grow out of our carnality and out of sin into a life of holiness. God believes in tough love. How many of you are familiar with that concept? <laughs> this is a goodly child. I'm willing to discipline them. I'm willing to, to institute some rules, some boundaries. Why? Because I want to hurt them. No, because I love them so much. I want them to succeed, and I can see ahead of them, higher than them from a higher perspective. I know what's better for them. When there's a higher purpose, when you know that somebody can do better, when you truly believe in someone, you're willing to invest in that. If you don't believe somebody can improve, 
you tend to just leave them alone, don't you? I'm not even going to tackle that because I don't believe they can do that. That's the opposite of love. Hebrews 12 and 6 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and he scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. That's love. He believes in you, and he wants you to have life. The Scripture tells us more abundantly, and he's willing to help bring in the borders. He's willing to bring in the boundaries and help me progress the way that I'm supposed to. Some of you may have read the book, Strings Attached. It's about a teacher who changed his student's life. But he was too tough on students for today's standards. How many of you have read this book or heard of this gentleman? It's a very interesting book. He was a music teacher from 1958 to 1995 in East Brunswick, New Jersey. He was a Ukrainian immigrant, and he was strict. He was demanding, his students said, and he was passionate. His name was Jerry Kopinski. He was known to his students as Mr. K., and the book says he forced his students to improve. How well do you think that would go over today, Elder Staten? <laughs> he was the conductor for the high school orchestra, and he died in 2009. But he was known for his iron-handed, sister, sister Brittany would appreciate this, because <laughs> he was all about violins and cellos. He was known for his iron-handed, take-no-prisoner style. He, he started his daughter at three years old to learn the violin. She had to stand up on this little box in front of all the other students because she was going to take first chair, and he didn't want them to think that he was just um, doing it because it was his daughter. He made her take the same rigorous test they did, so they had to give her a box so she could be seen by the people who was doing the judging. Phenomenal. She made first chair. <laughs> but his take-no-prisoner style included yanking children's elbows into place. That wouldn't go over. Shouts of, what is the matter with you? Who's tone deaf over in the first violin section? I'm not really advocating this. I'm just telling you the outcome. You'll see it here in a moment. And then that sounds like a group of hippos stuck in the bottom of the river. <laughs> he, he had some tough love for his students. But he is also known because he had students who accomplished amazing results, more so than any other high school director. Students played and excelled in the New Jersey All-State High School Orchestra, and he inspired many of them to become music educators and professional musicians. He himself was honored with many professional awards, and some of them were national. One of his previous students is the author of the book, along with his daughter, and she attributes her musical success to Mr. K's persistence, his optimism, and as she stated, his heckling of her. <laughs> Mr. K, she says, stuck to his formula of discipline, repetition, and hollering. <laughs> Yet there was something intoxicating, this is her words, about a teacher who had such absolute confidence. <laughs> Here's what kids are missing on what they're looking for. A teacher who had absolute confidence, faith really, in my ability to do better. And all as I was reading that, I couldn't help but thinking of my God. <laughs> Sometimes the scripture is hard to follow. There's difficult things that my carnality doesn't want to do. But my God knows, Jason, this is for your good. This is going to be for my kingdom's good. You follow it, you're going to end up seeing improvement. When Mr. K died, his memorial service overflowed with former students who came to honor him. And they played one final concert in his honor. Darlene Brandt, a music teacher he taught in the 1950s, said, We succeeded at first because we were afraid not to. And later, we be, and later we succeeded because we knew this man believed that we could play brilliantly, and so we believed it ourselves. Do you see what that instills in somebody? When you're willing to hold them in line and say, this is the guidelines, you need to follow this, it lets them know, you know what, you're capable of doing it. I would just leave you alone and let you wallow in your misery if I didn't think you had in you what it took to succeed. Oh, God's placed something inside of us, brothers and sisters. The scripture says he's given us the power of the Holy Ghost to end up making us something. You're not doing this on your own. You're a child of God, and he's come to live inside of you. He's filled you with his power. He's given you an apostolic burden. What are you going to end up doing with it? The scripture says, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria unto the uttermost part of the earth. God is good all the time. He has faith in you. You can grow into the child of God he intends you to be. You can do it. Amen. God is good. Amen. God bless you. Let's stand. Let's ask God's anointing upon his word.
Help us to take his word out there to be witnesses of his goodness. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for every promise that you've given us. Thank you for the faith that you have in us, your willingness to offer up your life for us. You thought enough of us to die on the cross for our sins. And yet beyond that, you came and gave us the power of the Holy Ghost that we can go out and do exploits, that we can be a witness of you and see salvation brought to those who are in need. I ask you to encourage your people, give us a holy boldness to go out and to spread your good news. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Bless the time of refreshment. We give you thanks for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you. You're dismissed.